Hey there. Welcome back to Ground Zero Salem. As always, I'm your host, Pat. So this update, very exciting. I'm going to bring back an old series, revive, exhume from the earth, an old concept that I haven't visited in six years at this point. This is going to be an update to the subgenre wars series that I used to do way back at the old location in actual Salem in the basement. I did four updates total, I believe. I'll, uh, Put them up here on the side. Look at look at my baby face. Look how young and innocent I was. There we go. Um, the concept was pretty simple. I would take two disparate subgenres within hardcore punk and metal, and kind of compare and contrast. Generally, one subgenre would be one that I was really well versed in and worshipped the heck out of, and one that I was kind of picky about. And then I'd try to find a middle ground band that bridged the gap between the two. It was a fun little exercise. Um, I believe I did NYHC versus D-Beat. I did Proto Metalcore, which Metallic Hardcore, something I've been really into lately, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, Proto Metalcore versus Brutal Thrash, so Demolition Hammer type stuff. Grindcore versus Youth Crew. And uh, Stoner Doom versus Venom and Motorhead Worship kind of, Midnight kind of stuff. So those were all fun. It's kind of fun to look back on those because... My tastes are always evolving, just like anybody's, uh, or anybody that's equally obsessed with music like a weirdo. My tastes are always evolving, so I I've noticed lately, looking back on it, I haven't thought about these updates in quite a while, uh, just looking at the old thumbnails and stuff, I listen to just as much D-Beat, if not more, than NYHC these days. That metallic hardcore stuff, I've obviously been really deep diving on that the past year or so, so... You know, probably listening to that more than Brutal Thrash. Things change. i not burnt out on that Motorhead Venom stuff necessarily, but I don't reach for anything other than, like, the Originators that much these days. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So I was actually inspired to do this by another YouTuber, Mike over at Uncommon Paller. He was doing uh, the 2024 punk tag, and he was talking about Crust, I think one of the topics was show a crust record and he showed off sacrilege. I'll show a little snippet of his uh, take on crust here. Oh, yeah, yeah, crust punk. Now, crust is, it's a slippery slope. It's one of those things where it's become a, a kind of a catch-all term, kind of like post-punk, um, where it's just if you don't really know how to categorize something, you just, or you want to be lazy about it, you just throw it right into, uh, right under the crust punk banner or the, uh, or the post-punk banner. Um, a lot of people associate crust punk with bands like, uh, you know, like even something like Disrupt or, you know, State of Fear and, and that kind of stuff. But when I was first made aware way back when of, of the term crust, uh, it was always like really metallic hardcore bands with kind of guttural vocals, um, usually played it you know, kind of a slow pace, not like the, you know, rapid fire shit that's called crust today. Um, so I'm going with that because that's my, uh, that's my, you know, my outlook on it. Um, so I'm going with sacrilege behind the realms of madness on children of the revolution records from 1985. Uh, yeah, this is exactly what I just said. It's, I mean, there's some up-tempo tracks on this, but there's a lot of slower tracks, very metallic. Uh, female vocalist on here who just sounds guttural as fuck. Um, pretty celebrated record. It's been reissued. Um, originals get a little bit pricey. And this happens to be an original, so yeah. And now I won't have to show off Sacrilege. <laughs> Mike did it for me. Uh, but his point does make sense. I remember an old article in the Felix Von Havoc column of Maximum Rock and Roll. If you ever read MRR back in the day, it was the massive Bible of DIY, underground, hardcore, and punk, spanning coverage of everything from garage rock to crust to militant, vegan, straight-edge hardcore. It covered everything. I think it still exists online. But it had columnists, and Felix Von Havoc was a pretty well-regarded, respected uh, elder of the kind of more crusty uh, DIY hardcore scene in Minneapolis. He was in Destroy, Code 13, uh, Damage Deposit after that. Um, guy who knows his stuff. Very, very serious collector of a lot of international hardcore, 
um, does Havoc Records, has done it for over 20 years now at this point. He did these great columns where he'd go through Grindcore, uh, Vital releases, and Crust, and talk about it. He had the stance that a lot of people, similar to Mike's just now, that a lot of people regarded Crust as bands like Disrupt, uh, State of Fear, Doom, um, later on, stuff that even wove in more influences internationally, like Tragedy. I can't remember if Tragedy was around by the time he was writing this or not. It might have been a few years before, uh, but I digress. The, the real crust was what is known more commonly as Stenchcore, which is all this early Peaceville, uh, UK, really more gloomy stuff that is heavily influenced by Amoebics and Celtic Frost, and that's the real crust punk. So, like anything over time, genre names and what we consider things shift around. And I think it's a similar kind of deal with an arco punk, um, where it's more of a an aesthetic and a lyrical approach than a style of music, as you'll see. So I'm going to be comparing both of these. Um, he said that, uh, going back to Felix for a second, he said that crusty hardcore was stuff like Doom and even ENT and Disrupt, and the true crust bands are some of the types of stuff I'm going to talk about. As far as anarcho-punk, I thought it was something that it was at least partially self-applied by the bands. After all, Crass, who were the, the daddies of the whole thing, were anarchists, lived on a commune, did all that kind of stuff, farmed, you know, went to protests, all that kind of thing. Um, but it looks like, according to the book I'm reading on the subhumans right now, the uh, biography by Ian Glasper, a lot of that was kind of a tag put on by Gary Bushell and other people at Sounds Magazine, which was a prominent music newspaper magazine in the UK that covered a lot of this stuff. Through one reason or another, things got put in different buckets. Um, so anarcho-punk apparently was more of a media term, which I guess, you know, I, I guess that makes sense. Enough babbling, enough preamble. Let me take a sip of my tea. Yorkshire tea, appropriately. Hey, Pat from the future here. I forgot to mention at this point, uh, which genre I was kind of picky about and which one I was really, really into. Crust, no matter how you define it, whether it's the very specific way or the more open, crusty, hardcore definition of it, has always been a big favorite of mine since I discovered it. Um, there aren't too many crust bands I really dislike. Whereas in Arco Punk, I've grown to love a lot more of it over the years, but I'm still kind of picky. I'm going to talk about plenty of releases I like in this. I definitely went over <laughs> my usual allotted five records or so that I do for these things. Uh, but there's still a lot of anarcho-punk that just kind of seems to drag for me. It is a very versatile genre, as you'll see, though. So uh, let me get back to my tea here. I hope all that makes sense. It's a little disjointed. What are you going to do? Um, so I wanted to talk about the originators of the genre first. Why is Crass at the bottom? Crass. Crass. Um, a lot of people talk about the birth of punk and how Sex Pistols were a boy band and it was all just a big scam to make money. I, I feel like there's a lot of revisionist history with that. Yeah, Malcolm McLaren, who was the Sex Pistols manager, seemed to be a pretty big scumbag and wanted to make money, but they did and said some pretty subversive stuff in late 70s Britain. I mean, God Save the Queen in Britain alone, I mean, I think was enough to really freak people out. I think it did more than just ruffle a few feathers, if you know what I mean. And I know that Vivian Westwood, who also had a lot to do with their image and their concept, was super into the Dada movement and a lot of like very heavy left-leaning political philosophy. But at any rate, it was kind of a kind of a scam, you know, really at the end of the day, I suppose. And it was people like Crass who were like, no, no, let's take this seriously. Not just anarchy as in anarchy and chaos. Let's talk about Bakunin and, and stuff like that. Musically, this is the most weirdly, like, not, not musically adept, but insanely catchy record ever. It's a deconstruction of music. It's got a lot of weird kind of marching band rhythms and very noisy grating guitars and these rapid fire lyrics. Um, courtesy of Steve Ignorant, who apparently wasn't like a very politically minded guy. I guess he was sort of an intimidating yabo who they picked up off the street, according to what I've read. Very snotty, you know, heavy British accent, kind of punk vocals. One aspect of anarcho-punk is it is very wordy, it is very verbose. So there's a lot of lyrics about a lot of stuff they're having feels about on this. 
It's, uh, yeah, Feeding of the 5,000, the only one I, I really pick up by Crass, I have to say. I can appreciate some of their later stuff. They get way more experimental, way more inaccessible as the albums go on, but always very, very mind-provoking material and excellent lyrics. Then, from Crust, you have the originators, Amoebix. Arise. This was... I'm trying to think their first proper full length i believe everything that they did before is collected on a few different comps with different names before this spider leg recordings and a few other ones that are unofficial hey hate to keep doing this editing bay pat back at you uh so technically no sanctuary i guess would qualify as their first proper lp which came out on spider leg recordings in 1983 i was just reviewing uh, all my stuff on Discogs, and I saw that that came out first. I'm just so conditioned to th that recording and those recordings around that time, that Killing Joke sounding era Amoebic stuff, being on weird bootlegs before it got reissued on uh, Alternative Tentacles, which was also a compilation. So, yeah, the No Sanctuary LP, I think technically I could probably get away with calling it a mini LP, but or a maxi EP, or something like that. But, yeah, that, that did come first, so... Just crossing my T's and dotting my I's because I care about you. Back to the action. This, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is the first proper full length. Uh, this was reissued on Alternative Tentacles, and I believe it originally came out on Alternative Tentacles as well. I mean, what, what can be said about Amoebics and their, their sound? Um, to focus away from everything that Baron believes nowadays, let's just strike that for the record and not even think about that. Um, incredible kind of primitivist lyrics um, about rising up against the powers that be. A mu musical approach that I've said before sounds not unlike Venom on cough syrup. Like it's this murky, heavier new wave of British heavy metal with the atmosphere of Killing Joke. There's some great galloping on it. Um, there's almost some sort of, almost like Celtic Frost kind of vibes on it as well. I don't know if that's intentional or not, if those guys were listening to CF. But this record's fantastic. It's it's the best one. Monolith, the one after this, is also very good. Very strong Motorhead influence throughout as well. So, uh, great. There's a, a bonus 7-inch on here that has a song called Right to Ride that's pretty much just like a Motorhead song, sound-wise. Um, now, I'll go down the line of like the stuff I'm most familiar with and have a strong connection to and then get to eventually newer artists. Before... I go any further, I should mention what we're listening to. This, this is We Won't Take No More. This is a CD compilation of a bunch of different comps, I think seven inches, put onto one CD from Mortar Hate. Mortar Hate was Conflict's uh, label, which is a band we'll be talking about covering in this. And uh, good good uh, mix of bands on here. You got Verrukers, Toxic Waste from uh, Ireland, UK Subs, I think Northern Ireland, UK Subs, The Partisans, The Insane, Icons of Filth, uh, even DOA from Canada, Oi Polloi from Scotland, love that band. Uh, the other Anthrax, real quick, funny anecdote, there was a metalhead guy that was like an older metalhead I'd see at shows in Rochester and Buffalo all the time, who looked like he was straight out of the 80s before it was a retro thing. Like mid 90s, he had a backwards flipped up suicidal hat with a bandana under it and this leather covered in like metal band logos. On the back was a massive Anthrax UK Capitalism is Cannibalism uh, graphic, and I'm pretty sure he didn't know that it wasn't the Anthrax from the United States with Joey Baldana. I'm pretty sure he just saw it somewhere and was like, oh, that's cool, I've never seen that Anthrax logo before. I could be wrong. Maybe he was into a ton of thrash metal and won an Arco punk band that just happened to have the same name as a legendary thrash band, but I, I think he I think he wasn't in the know. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, cool comp. That'll be playing in the background. I think that was Broken Bones. All right, sliding back over to Anarcho. Uh, subhumans, man. Rats. Hey! Couldn't have planned that better. Rats and Time Flies But Airplanes Crash. Two separate EPs, two separate recording sessions, one from 83, one from 84. Um, I like everything the Subhumans have done. They're one of my favorite punk bands. Dick Lucas, one of my favorite lyricists, up there with Chris Callahan. Uh, just, just a very varied band. They talk in the book that I've been reading, their autobiography, biography, 
um, about how they didn't really feel comfortable being labeled anarcho-punk. Uh, they were cool with all those bands, but they were kind of just doing their own thing. And I do find Dick Lucas's lyrics a lot more relatable and just kind of more straightforward and digestible and more like every man than a lot of uh, typical anarcho-punk bands like Crass or whatever. And their music's so diverse. I mean, they have a song with piano on this, piano only. Uh, I think some other instrumentation, mostly piano in the front anyway. And Dick singing, and it's just about the life, of a really sad life of a woman named Susan. And it's heartbreaking. It's so good. Um, there's some other great jams on this. This came out on Blurg, which is... Dick's own imprint uh, labels that's one of my favorite I mean it's an old concept in punk like we shouldn't label each other and what does it actually say about us as a person yada yada it's well worn territory at this point but I mean singing about that in 1979 I think is a something really ahead of the curve um, Blurg Records all these bands kind of had their own little imprints uh, I want to say there is Mortar Hate there's Crass Records Spider Leg Records it's kind of, um, I think something in the UK at the time, there was government assisted doled out to people that wanted to start their own businesses. So a lot of people started labels. I believe Peaceville started that way, maybe even Earache too. So it's interesting, like every single band has their own label accompanying it. But yeah, very, oh my God. <laughs> There's super varied music uh, ranging from, you know, almost proggy elements throughout their discography to reggae, uh, to straightforward raging punk rock one of the best things to do it in punk in general not just anarcho punk then you've got hell bastard ripper crust i had to grab this because i mean that's where that's where it comes from um this is extremely raw it was originally a demo um i i did recommend this to people into demo level death metal and uh raw black metal too um just really really gross feral snarling stuff again that sort of weirdly sluggish underwater kind of chugging Obviously, thrash metal had left its imprint on everybody in the punk scene at that point. I feel like everybody, even if they didn't cop to it, liked Metallica. So you can hear a little bit of the, the, the choking up on the E and the kind of thrash metal influences on a lot of these UK records. I think the Celtic Frost thing was coming through as well. Um, it's got that kind of heaviness to it. But a punk attitude, you know, um, a clear influence on everything that I'm going to be talking about one way or the other is Discharge, of course. You know, D-Beat is kind of its own thing that crosses over with Crust and I think has kind of absorbed itself into Crust at this point. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, the, the rhythmic approach of Discharge left an indelible mark on almost everything I'm going to be talking about. But, yeah, this is a fantastic, gloomy piece of nightmarish Crust here. One of the originators of it. Got way more metal later on, kind of almost turned into a full-on thrash metal band by the end of the 80s or beginning of the 90s. They had a record I can't recall the name of. I have the tape over there. It uh, came out on Earache. There was a song on the Grind Crusher comp, and I kind of like that record, too. It's it's not terrible. It's almost like technical thrash, though. Then you've got Death Church by Rudimentary Peni. Good old Rudy P. in the hizzy. Talked about these guys recently with that... Uh, that reference to Lovecraft, that literary thing in the metal tag. Um, just to reiterate what I said before, this is anarcho-punk, but it's so odd and so nightmarish and incredibly tight. Um, really, really good bass playing, three-piece, evoking a lot of just very, very evil, weird stuff without being remotely metal. Nick Blinko, the chief songwriter, kind of wore his issues and his mental health problems on his sleeve as well as his politics and it really shows through he did all the artwork for this and all the artwork for all their records um i i'm told he drew it out on on like huge pieces of paper on the wall it's like tiny very detailed pen and ink stuff just these nightmare escapes uh, very very cool um also not completely self-serious either there's a lot of little kind of like jokes here and there i think there's like uh, a lyric there's a lyric on one of their songs that says, uh, states, half of the world is starving, the other half is dead. Something along those lines. So, yeah, you know, dark kind of um, gallows humor kind of stuff. Upbeat and punk, but very twisted. You got Prophecy of Doom. Another one of the flagship OG crust bands. 
This is probably the most metallic out of all the records I'm showing today. Acknowledge the Confusion Master. This is a reissue that came out on Peaceville. These guys are pretty, pretty metal looking at this point. Uh, I think they have some earlier material that's a bit rougher. I have a discography CD as well. These folks were featured on that Grindcore compilation. You could probably find it on YouTube. I have a DVD of it. It's a hard and heavy video magazine compilation of all the death metal stuff. Um, it says Grindcore, but it's mostly death metal. Uh, Prophecy of Doom is on there, and they fit in pretty well, but it's kind of funny because they're talking about how, oh, we used to be punks back in the day, and we've sort of moved beyond that. And I mean, uh, we're around from the, the early punk days, and we were all punks, but uh, it's still true to our hearts. And uh, punk's not exactly fashionable now, but uh, it's still in our hearts. I don't really think people think of them as a death metal band still. They're still regarded as a crust band. And the music's there, you know, it's that gloomy, uh, mid-paced, foreboding kind of crust punk stuff, but there is something a little bit more uh, grind influenced about it, tone wise. There's a really weird vocal approach that sounds like the dude's kind of like inhaling or something. It's very strange, very singular. It's very loud and relatively well produced. So that kind of shines through a little bit more. It's certainly got that early earache kind of vibe to it, even though they were a, a Peaceville band. I think a lot of that stuff was being put out by Peaceville a little bit before and overlapping with the beginning of the Doom Death stuff that Hammy was putting out. Since I'm talking about Hammy, let's talk about the Instigators. This is uh, Paul Hamshaw of Peaceville Records' first band, or earliest band of note that I'm aware of. The Blood is on Your Hands. This is a vinyl compilation of a seven inch and some demo stuff. This is super aggressive, catchy anarcho-punk. Uh, really bouncy, really angry, like almost hardcore. Um, yeah, it reaches like U.S. hardcore levels of aggression. Early 80s U.S. hardcore levels of aggression. Rapid fire, spitting back and forth. Um, intense lyrics about the church not liking them. <laughs> uh, you know, genocide, forgotten few. It's an example of a couple song titles on there. But yeah, this is this stuff's great. I mean, and uh, to talk about you know the the labels and how they helped each other out. Their early stuff was put out by Blurg, which was Dick from the Subhumans label, so there you go. But yeah, great, almost kind of like pogo, like angry pogo kind of vibes on this. Axe Grinder, Rise of the Serpent Men. So another another peaceful one. These guys sound a lot like Amoebics. <laughs> like not one-to-one -one cloning, but darn close. Like a little bit more, I'd say a little bit more a beat, uh, a little bit more direct sounding, a little less foggy. You know, Amoebics really had this aura of, like, fog and gloom. Uh, Axe Grinder has that, too, but I think it's a little bit more visceral. Uh, but, yeah, that, that mid-paced, you know, metal-adjacent kind of riffs, you know, that kind of thing. That's what Axe Grinder has in spades. The Grind the Enemy demo is really, really good, too. But, yep, reissued by Peaceville. As soon as these popped up again, I was like, oh, yeah, because, um, I mean, old old pressings of that and the Prophecy of Doom were pretty up there. So up next we've got the mob, Let the Tribe Increase. This is a good example of how nebulous the term anarcho-punk can be because this is far closer sonically to post-punk or something like Joy Division or New Model Army than anything really directly punk sounding, we'll say. Very mournful, um, not very like very distorted guitars, like very bass forward sound wise. Um, kind of repetitive, hypnotic song structures and, and very sad kind of sounding vocals. Like definitely if, if you like post-punk, if you like Joy Division and stuff like that, uh, this is like the anarcho equivalent almost. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of demo versions and seven inch versions on here. But yeah, out of all the anarcho bands, one of my favorites. Uh, for years I was like, I don't like anarcho punk, except for Rudimentary P&I and The Mob. Those are the only two good bands. And uh, I don't feel that way anymore, obviously, but there's a reason why I like the mob so much. They really stood out to me. Of course, Crust made its way to our shores here in America and kind of evolved into its own thing. Uh, it got particularly big in New York and California and Minneapolis, which you previously mentioned. Uh, Felix Von Havoc lived, Profane Existence Records put out a lot of that stuff. Uh, it definitely evolved here and kind of became its own thing. You know, we're not talking about one-to-one -one sounding bands that were completely a clone of Axe Grinder or Amoebics. 
You can hear a lot of the Meebix influence on the early bands, of course. Of course, Nausea from New York, one of the most well-known crust punk bands. Uh, and they have the Amoebix thing going on, but also a lot more like kind of upbeat stuff. Uh, some cool, like really, really tasteful metal soloing. Uh, a lot of discharge influence, but they get that that sort of um, that ominous Amoebix riffing down really, really well. They're getting two EPs reissued on a 12 inch soon, or I think it actually might be out by now. I'll have to check. It's very soon. It's happening in March. Uh, it's coming out on Svart. Hopefully, that means Extinction. This record will also be out at some point on 12 inch. I think they have official t-shirts and everything. Um, I love Nausea. As time goes on, they're more and more one of my favorite bands. I like everything they've done. The more raw stuff with their original vocalist, Neil. The more metallic, gloomy stuff with this guy, Al. Amy, uh, the other vocalist, always pissed sounding. A band that kind of bridged gaps between scenes and genres. Amy was married to Roger from Agnostic Front for years and they had a kid together. This was actually recorded on, um, I read recently, I hope it's correct, uh, it was recorded on AF and Nuclear Assault's gear. Apparently they didn't have very good gear, which, I mean, that that tracks for <laughs> cross punk bands. They wanted it to sound good, so they recorded, uh, they borrowed gear from Nuclear Assault, so that's like John Connolly's amp or whatever that you're hearing on this. But yeah, I mean, I love this stuff. This is so good. Um, this is a masterpiece, the, the full length, and I, I like all the EPs as well. All worth checking out. Uh, excited for those reissues. Speaking of Al from Nausea, he was a member of Misery from Minneapolis before he moved to New York. This is their split with SDS from Japan. One of the best crust splits ever. SDS is awesome, super heavy really thrashy crust, like a very, very strong thrash metal influence, super beefy sound, great. Misery, similar in a lot of ways. Um, I feel like Misery was almost starting to lean into the, the death metal stuff that was happening ever so slightly at the time, but all, they have that crushing gloom, um, and the occasional fast part that keeps you from getting too bored or getting too distracted. Uh, Pain and Suffering is the name of their side, but everything Misery's done, I really like. Even their later stuff that's a little bit more I don't even know what to say about it. Make a little bit more like uh, post-punky, a little bit more Killing Joke influenced, I guess. Uh, yeah, all their stuff is great. Awesome band, Misery. This was uh, reissued just a year or two ago by Profane Existence. I had a couple of copies in my distro, but they got snapped up. I think you could probably get them for very cheap. That's a nice thing about Profane. They don't, they don't really don't jack up the prices on anything. They're very affordable. This is one band that. Icons of Filth that I, I couldn't get into for years. I just thought they were kind of like humdrum, neither here nor there. You know, they were kind of angry like Conflict was, and they kind of had the, the heavy amount of lyrics crammed into one spot, like most of these bands kind of do. And it's grown on me a lot. This is Onward Christian Soldiers. Um, it's, I think it's like a, let's see. Okay, no, it's official. It came out on Puke and Vomit. You'd think with that name, Icons of Filth, and that cover art, which is incredible, that they'd be more on the crusty side. And I mean, there's certain similarities and overlap between two, the two genres, and it's kind of easy to pick out bands that kind of straddle both. This band does have some very gloomy elements, but it's not heavy the way Crust is. It's definitely an arco punk. Um, very catchy, you know. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily oi but it does have that inherently british catchiness to it that a lot of a lot of uh stuff like this does there's some great riffs very angry very verbose uh very dark anarcho-punk pretty fast at points and then obviously if you know if you're not completely ignorant to this stuff if you've heard a crust and you know the, the deal a little bit I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Deviated Instinct. This is the Terminal Filth Stenchcore 86 demo, also recently reissued on uh, Agipunk and Terminal Filth. Uh, this is early Deviated Instinct. They certainly got a lot more heavy after this. Rock and Roll Conformity and Welcome to the Orgy. They almost went in the direction of Prophecy of Doom that was uh, nearing closer to like a death and grind sort of thing. Um, this actually probably would be a good gap bridger between the anarcho punk stuff and uh and crust uh certainly metallic in a lot of ways some of the riffs and everything um but the tone uh the recording style it's very stripped down 
kind of, the vocals really aren't getting gruff, gruff yet. There's a few moments where they kind of are, but it's more of a hoarse shout, you know, more of a hardcore kind of vocal approach. And, man, yo, like, I mean, the fashion, the style. Whew, look at that style. Just, just like metalheads that crawled out of a swamp, <laughs> essentially. Um, yeah, this is great. I recommend all their stuff. You can get a hold of it. I know that, um, I think it's Mid from that band. It had a band later called Bait that were pretty cool. I saw them open for Doom once when I was in the UK one time. They were really enjoyable. I got to track down some of their stuff. He also did uh, this artwork and a lot of the artwork for the, you'd probably recognize from Extreme Noise Terror and Napalm Death and a lot of other UK artists. I, I love his stuff. He did the cow skull wearing the gas mask and uh, the Mass Appeal Madness and all that, all those awesome pieces. So great artist too. And he commented on one of my videos once. So if you happen to see this, thanks buddy. Now, again, I, a narco punk coming over to the U.S. I talked about how Crust came to the U.S. I don't know if it really translated the same way. Um, I think later on, like in the 90s, there were some bands that did more of a straight up anarcho thing, uh, like Apolitical from Baltimore and a few others. More recently, Crisis Actors from Boston did a really good tape. The early bands that I feel like invoked anarcho punk kind of did it in their own way, like Reagan Youth. Uh, from New York and some others. I often think of Crucifix, who are just a great straight up hardcore band. A um, lot of sonic similarities to early Agnostic Front. It's kind of, I don't know if it's hotly contested, but it's discussed like, did they, they sounded like this a little bit before Victim in Pain came out, so maybe they influenced them. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. They were buddies with AF too. Um, and they went over and I think stayed with Crass. This came out on Corpus Christi, I think, which is a crass related label. You can see the center labels there. This folds out into a giant poster. Not going to do that. Uh, but really wild, frenetic, fast paced hardcore, heavily influenced by Discharge, kind of slurred, Tasmanian Devil kind of vocals. A um, lot of intense stuff about US intervention and war. Obviously, you can ju as judging by the cover there. Uh, one of my favorite hardcore records from the era, hands down. Certainly one of my favorites from California. Then you've got Iconoclast, also from California. Um, as far as the early 80s bands, this is the other one that came to mind. I'm a lot more new to Iconoclast. I'd say that they definitely sound more like Orange County hardcore, the really more raw side of it. Um, not a direct one-to-one, -one, but elements of it kind of remind me of very early Bad Religion, the uh, like, How Could Hell Be Any Worse, or TSOL. Um, before they went goth or something like that. Not nearly as snotty and surfer, but just the way the, the riffs sound and, and stuff like that. Um, that's the stuff on the demo. Some of the stuff from the 7-inch feels like it's a little bit more British. There's like some softer moments that are a little bit more theatric that you'd get on some of the anarcho-punk bands. But yeah, good stuff. Sealed Records this was re released on. Big old booklet in this. I don't show off everything, but why not? It's pretty cool. There's a lot of great photos in there. Let's see who they play with. Armistice, Dr. No, Shattered Faith. I think that's a good example of like the type of California hardcore I'm trying to think of here. Ill repute. You know, all that all that SoCal stuff. Um, played with that stuff, but they were like anarcho lyrically. And as Cross kind of evolved throughout the years, like I said. It started pulling in all these other different genres and scenes, and uh, it became this very huge net to describe things, this sort of nebulous, again, that's the main comparison I can think of between these two types of genres, other than like politically being pretty left-leaning. Left um, they both like mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. When I got into Crust, when I was a, got into my gross phase, my, my patch pants phase, to me, when, when I discovered everything, it was definitely Disrupt. Disrupt was the most accessible thing that was even close to any of this because they were on Relapse. I could buy the CD at the mall, which I did. Uh, Doom. Doom had just had some stuff reissued on Profane Existence. Uh, even, I mean, even with my friends, we were talking about bands like Spaz and Man is the Bastard, like they were crust bands because it was close enough sonically. I think in my area where I grew up, in Syracuse, there wasn't a lot of stuff like that that you could find. 
So if it wasn't street punk, like spiky hair casualty stuff, and it wasn't Victory Records basketball jersey core, it was crust. <laughs> and uh, over the years, I, you know, eventually learned what power violence was, uh, learned the difference between crust and straight up grind. I mean, they all bleed over into each other. It's just interesting, you know. Uh, it did inv- evolve over the years, though, and, and started ev- involving, like I said, bands like Tragedy, uh, who took influence from a lot of that early crust stuff, like Amoebix, but also tons of Japanese hardcore. Uh, early Neurosis, the very first Neurosis record, I think, was monumentally influential on a lot of stuff. Um, bands like Devoid of Faith, who also, I feel, got labeled as crust, but more were uh, early Neurosis, international hardcore kind of thing. Um, you know, these things all kind of like float around. I feel like there was a bunch of bands from the West Coast that were around in the 2000s that were like, all right, let's focus on this specific sound, the stench core kind of stuff. That's what basically everybody started calling the OG cross core bands, calling it stench core. And I think that's sort of a, a mechanism to kind of properly describe a certain sound that had gotten, you know, diluted by a bunch of other bands that were nebulously connected to it. Another good example of that was everybody started calling everything goth. Pardon the side tangent, but there was a time when I got into goth and it was Bauhaus and Sisters of Mercy and some of the bands on Cleopatra Records at the time, like uh, The Wake and Rosetta Stone. That was goth. But I feel like after Typo Negative and Marilyn Manson and Korn got big, goth started covering a lot of stuff that it really shouldn't have, I feel like, that subgenre name. So everybody started calling the old stuff death rock. And I think in certain regional areas, it was known as death rock anyway. Um, I don't know. I feel like the advent of the internet really codified what stuff got called. And Tangent. Big tangent. Anyway, there was a new wave of crust on the West Coast um, in the 2000s. It included bands like Hellshock from Portland, Stormcrow from Oakland. Um, there were a bunch more. I wasn't really into this stuff at the time as it came out. My tastes in the mid to late 2000s were very like traditional hardcore and some other stuff. I wasn't listening to a ton of metal other than the stuff that I liked. So like newer bands that were coming from a more metallic side of things, I kind of gave the pass to. So I've gotten into this stuff the past couple of years. And this is awesome. This is such a beefy record. Only the Dead Know the End of War. It's a cassette copy. Also, Hellshock put out a record last year, or the year before, that was really, really good. Um, incredibly heavy, almost just a straight-up death metal band. It was self-titled. Uh, this is pretty metal. It's pretty death metal-ish, but it's got that that certain kind of gloom, that certain plotting uh, element to it. It dispersed between all the ripping fast parts that's very, very traditional crust or stench core. Uh, Stormcrow's a little bit more... A little bit more plotting, a little bit more doomy, but have, you know, fastness to them as well. Um, both have, like, really monstrous sounding vocalists that sound killer. Really good bands. And also you had Guided Cradle. I read about this band a while ago. If I'm not mistaken, it's a combination of people from Eastern Europe and an American or two. I'll have to double check that. But again, Stenchcore, you know, you got these sort of medieval themes going on. Um crushing like Dungeons and Dragons uh, fucking ripping rock and roll <laughs> got a couple more examples here this I just threw on um, as I was preparing for this drinking tea Omega Tribe No Love Lost this is awesome um, I just I picked this up listened to it a couple times I think I bought it when I still lived in Salem nothing about it really imprinted on me so I threw it on again I need to spin this more it's cool it's got the the, the volatile kind of anger of bands like Conflict and also occasionally melodic stuff going on. It's really well recorded for anarcho-punk stuff. Um, male and female trade-off vocals. Very enjoyable record. Pretty unique in its sound. Another example, if you're looking for more kind of accessible stuff, uh, stuff that's a fun listen, bouncy, catchy kind of stuff, you can't go wrong with Zounds for anarcho-punk. This is the Curse of Zounds. 20 songs. I think it's a comp of all their stuff. Uh, this band is awesome. So much fun. Almost like a more sped up gang of four or something like that. Just really, um, really just fun, catchy, lighter side of anarcho punk kind of stuff. Almost kind of dancey. It's awesome. Obviously, I can't 
cover everything. Um, hopefully I won't get too many comments like, what about this band? What about that band? Kind of deal because I can't, nor do I want to cover every single band. Uh, I should probably mention Conflict though. This is Conflict compilations here. Standard issue 82 through 87 and 88 through 94. Um, these are comps. Uh, Conflict kind of hit or miss with me. They have some really, really good songs. They have some stuff where I get kind of bored too. Very verbose, again. Uh, but they're, they're banger songs you cannot go wrong with. The Serenade is Dead, especially. Um, very, uh, they, they even throw in some like synths on a few songs that really create this like grandiose kind of deal. Um, when they're on, they're on with their lyrics. Really, really good lyrics. Um, and more of the hardcore kind of side of, of Anarcho. Very angry and, and aggressive kind of stuff. Yeah, super aggressive if you're at a Morbosa Dad gig, right? Yeah, Colin. I whittled it down to two more. <laughs> the original series that I did this, I did five of each. I don't know what I was thinking. I just kept pulling more and more stuff. I'm, ex I'm excited, obviously. Can't you tell? Um, this is recent. Band from Russia. Fatum? Fatum? Fatum, we'll say. Life Dungeons. How about that? I love this aesthetic with a lot of crust. All the, the Celtic knotwork and everything. That's just so cool. I mean, I'm a fantasy dork, so this is hitting the right parts of my lizard brain, you know? Really, really cool pen and ink art. Again, this is the thrashy stuff again. Um, not too dissimilar to... I'm trying to think what are good classic examples of really thrashy crust. Um, the Hell Bastard Heading for Internal Darkness LP. Um, the Sacrilege stuff. This is right along those lines. It's just dirty enough sounding to not come off like a thrash record. You know, it's got enough nastiness to it where it's still crust, um, but it's very, very thrash. And it even says so on their little poster. I actually will unfurl this poster because it's so cool looking. I want to share it with you, my viewers. Power Crust Dungeon Thrash. That's what's up. A recent one woman anarcho-punk project recording project called cry out sadly um this person's no longer with us rosie davis 89 to 2020 uh really good record uh, i guess it wasn't finished you know they it was cobbled together um jonah falco mastered it and uh mixed by sam risser put out on la vida es un muse but certainly the more experimental end of anarcho-punk. I know Crass is a very good example of that later on. There's a few other bands that I'm not super familiar with that I'm kind of remiss to, to think of right now. Maybe Flux of Pink Indians got kind of experimental, uh, but there's a lot of like noise washing over this and uh, layered kind of melodic singing on it. There's uh, some kind of more like drum machine approach with uh, the rhythmic stuff going on with it. It's uh, very catchy and bouncy. Rosie covered a lot of ground in just four songs. Um, there's mournful elements to it. There's a song that's really kind of like jump up, like pogo kind of uh, sounding. It's a good 15, 20 minutes worth of uh, really, really killer punk. R.I.P. A lot of people like this when it came out. This is Rigorous Institution. Pretty recent. Kane Smarsh. Really, really thick hypnotic kind of sound here. A lot of that weird circling drums that Amoebix used so well on their earlier, more Killing Joke influenced stuff. Spider leg recordings, etc. Songs like Winter and Moscow Madness and that kind of stuff. Um, this borrows, I think, just as much from that earlier Amoebix before the Metallic Amoebix stuff that they did. This is also influenced by the heavier stuff as well. There's a lot of post-punk influence on this um, and some black metal too. This is a great record. They did a tape after this that's also killer can't remember where they're from, Rigorous Institution. Up in a, uh, this came out on Blackwater from Portland. They're probably from Portland. We'll see. And then finally, you've got Unsanitary Napkin from New Zealand. That's great. Great. If you've seen the movie Society, I think that's a nod there. Jeff Bezos pulling his face off. Of course, you got to have the, the stencil font border. Crucial. Um... Yeah, I mean, this is awesome. Uh, it's it's very, very catchy. It's definitely got that call and response, kind of um, vocal shout sort of thing going on. Uh, it doesn't stick to one tempo, which is really nice. There's stuff 
bridging on crust and hardcore. There's stuff that's a little bit more anthemic. They cover Do They Owe Us a Living by Crass and do a great job of it. Um, sounds really good. It's produced really well. Just so much piss and vinegar, so much vitriol uh, towards the status quo. Awesome stuff. And then, usually at the end of these kind of things, I try to come up with a release or a band that bridges the gap. Now, that's not that hard because there's a wide spectrum of sound between these two subgenres, you know? Uh, you could say that uh, Deviated Instinct is pretty close to like a hybrid or a, a meeting point between Crust and, Ar and Anarcho-Punk. Uh, you, can st you can say the same thing about that on Sanitary Napkin, although I think that's more of just Anarcho-Punk with really good production played really well more than anything else. It doesn't get that metallic. It's It's got a decently heavy sound. This is what happens when I fly by the seat of my pants and don't write an outline or figure out at least mentally, even vaguely, what I'm going to talk about before just pulling a pile of records. Um, of course, you can't cover, I can't cover everything in this and be completely comprehensive, but... I don't want to do anti-sect a disservice by not mentioning them, especially, I think, because they're a very early example of a band that kind of straddled the scenes, straddled the gap between anarcho-punk and Crust. Probably a really early influence on Crust, secondary to Amoebix. This is uh, In Darkness, There Is No Choice. Um, a lot of staple elements of anarcho-punk are contained therein, like the sort of repetition and uh, maybe some elements rhythmically, but a lot faster and a lot gloomier. Uh, it's got an overall like really sinister, shadowy kind of sound to it. Um, very driving musically. Very, very good. Only, only lightly metallic, but certainly like an early example of hardcore punk coming from the anarcho scene. And then a few years later, they gave us the single Out From The Void which is really great. This is around about the mid 80s. Only two songs, you can hear them going in a much more metallic kind of direction with it. A um, lot heavier. I wish they'd recorded more from this era. There's some live recordings that have a bunch of unreleased material from around this time. I think there's a recording from Leeds, if I'm not mistaken, could be wrong there. But yeah, Antisect, really great, important band for both of these and definitely um, a gap bridger for sure. All right, onward to Crest. But uh, if I were to think one band that's right in the middle, I'm, I'm thinking of Crest. This is their discography, uh, Propaganda and Lies. Uh, they have a great LP called Monuments that I used to own. I sent it to Marty because I love Marty and I thought he'd dig it. Um, Crest is intense. Crest, again, has sort of the marching band kind of rat-a-tat-tat -tat approach that uh, Crest sort of pioneered putting into punk. But they beef it up and it has almost more of like an industrial kind of feel to it very very heavy and it's got that throbbing gauzy just all enveloping sort of amoebix thing with their guitar sound and their bass sound and all of it uh, and if i'm remembering right they involve some some keys and some other elements to their music they're astounding live i've seen them twice I saw them in the uk with hell crusher once and i saw them in boston um which was kind of unfortunate because they have a they have a whole video setup of like a slideshow and movies projected over them as they play, and I always love it when bands do that. Uh, Neurosis had that early on, and that was always a cool experience. Unfortunately, I saw Cress at a venue that was like a wedding, normally a wedding venue, that had mirrors behind the band, so they couldn't project onto that. And they had to project it onto the opposite wall, like behind the people trying to watch the band. Didn't really work very well. They sounded awesome, though. Um, really killer band. I think they might be doing stuff again. I'll have to verify that. They just reissued, I forget what label, but the, the split with Doom was just reissued lately, which is included on this, which is also great. Um, I didn't talk about Doom um, because, like I said, uh, according to certain people, Doom is not a crust band, which blows my mind. Um, that is so odd to me because I just grew up thinking crust was Doom, Filth, uh, amoebics and if you want to get scholarly about it you know apparently apparently to the real heads out there it, there's only one of those that's approaching something that's actual crust which is funny um i think i read i think it was actually again i think it was felix havoc talking about a anniversary of one of doom's first seven inches coming out or something like that where he's like i was so excited to hear this because it was real hardcore and that's true when you think about it doom borrow heavily from Discharge, heavily from a lot of Swedish 
hardcore bands and just have like a much rougher, growlier approach to vocals. And I think that's what made it crust to a lot of people. I think too, at the end of the day, crust was just like, to people was just anything with growls that's sort of punk, you know? <laughs> um, so it's it's weird to think of things that way. I, I And I read certain clippings and press from around that time talking about doom like oh yeah like real raw hardcore is back i'm like okay i mean crust is a form of hardcore so why not yeah r rambling borderline incoherent stuff involving crust but it's such an interesting thing to me to think about how all this sort of relates and how language changes over time and how all this means different things at different times all the aforementioned swedish bands i think people consider crust and then you had bands like wolf brigade and wolf pack uh and uh, Skit System and all these bands that were traditionalist Swedish hardcore but produced better and, you know, uh, had sort of a metal-sounding production. People are like, well, that's crust. And I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, it kind of is for nowadays, but it, it's coming from a completely different place than the UK stuff that originated it. Anyways, this is all interesting. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Did you Are you a fan of crust? Are you a fan of anarcho-punk? What does it mean to you? Who are some of your favorite bands? Um, what springs to mind when we talk about this? Let's have a conversation about this in the comments below. Uh, yeah, that's that's about it for right now. Uh, this has gone way long. It's going to have a lot of editing because I'm a babbling brook right now. But, you know, you get that Yorkshire tea in you. You go, you go a little nuts, okay? We're getting crazy over here. It's noon. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to edit this later. I don't know. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, have a good weekend, weekday, evening, morning, or afternoon. GZS out.